Good morning. It's good to have you with us again as we go ahead and open the Word of God and uh, continue our study looking at the person of the Holy Spirit. If you've been following along for the last few episodes, we've been talking about his deity and personality. We've been talking about how he was uh, the promised helper uh, that Jesus promised uh, as he was talking to his disciples in the upper room just prior to his arrest and crucifixion and ultimately resurrection. Um, Jesus spoke of a number of things uh, that uh, the Holy Spirit would do in the course of his discourse with the disciples. Uh, and, uh, and of course, he also mentioned that it was to their benefit. All this, I should say, was um, really under the um, uh, understanding that he was telling them he was about to leave. But And as their hearts were troubled, he was letting them know that he was going to send another helper, somebody who would come alongside of them and not only be alongside, but even be in them. Uh, and so we spoke of the Holy Spirit in regard to a number of these things uh, that Jesus described him as doing and as being, uh, implied in being in those passages in John chapters 14 through 16. Um, but also we've looked at some of his activities as well, uh, as comforter, as uh, indweller, as the one who seals us, as the guaranteed possession of the Lord for uh, uh, in, in what Jesus accomplished. We talked about him uh, convicting the world of sin, of righteousness and judgment. We talked about um, uh, how he would guide us into all truth. Uh, the disciples, obviously, but even, of course, we look to him today for the same thing. As we open the word of God, we look to the Holy Spirit to help us understand these things more fully that we might ultimately be drawn more closely to Jesus. And so today we're going to continue talking about the Holy Spirit, but we're going to enter into um, uh, uh, sort of a, a mini study within this study. And this is a topic that I think is, is important for us to spend some time on. Uh, and uh, as we consider continue, continue to consider what the Holy Spirit does, today I want to begin to look at the fact that the Holy Spirit gifts. In other words, he gives, he gives gifts as he wills. Uh, and we call these the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so, um, <clears throat> the, and, and in particular, as we look at the passages, predominantly the passages we look at when we talk on this subject would be places like 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, I'm intentionally including chapter 13 in that, um, for, um, uh, for, for much of the information we get on this. Uh, we also look to Romans 12, uh, as we look uh, at some of the uh, other gifts that Paul describes in that passage as well. And uh, so we're going to spend time talking about this. Now, why talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit? I mean, after all, isn't this kind of a controversial subject even within the body of Christ? It is, and I think that's one of the reasons why we should talk about it. Uh, we should have an understanding of what these things are. Uh, we should consider whether or not these gifts are for today. If so, are all of them for today, or are there some maybe that aren't? Um, we can uh, talk about some of these issues. We should also approach this topic with, uh, with, a, with a keen eye toward the scripture because uh, as Paul talks about the subject, uh, beginning in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, <clears throat> he begins by, well, as a matter of fact, let's, let's go ahead and, and, and jump in. This is a good place for us to dive in. I'm going to go ahead and read verses 1 through 11 in 1 Corinthians. So if you got your Bible, as always, hope you do. As you're turning your page, I'm going to take a sip from my a very good cup of coffee. And uh, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians again, chapter 12. And so I'm going to go ahead and read, starting in verse 1, and read through verse 11, where Paul writes, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed or ignorant. You uh, know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given uh, through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits uh, or discerning of spirits, uh, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Now, a couple of things here as we sort of lay out an introduction to the study. We're not going to go through all the gifts today. We're going to begin to break them down 
in the following episodes. But by way of some introduction, um, a couple of really important things come up. First off, it is important for us, as Paul says, that we not be ignorant of these things, that we not be without understanding of these things. In the first century church, as Paul mentions here, a lot of them came out of pagan types of religions, uh, worshiping false gods, mute idols and such. And all of a sudden now they're experiencing genuine power. Uh, As a matter of fact, for uh, as carnal as the Corinthian church really was, uh, it is interesting that in their midst, the Holy Spirit is working pretty powerfully. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are in such operation Uh, that Paul actually has to help them understand a proper context for using them and understanding what they're for. Uh, And that brings us to another point. Not only do we not want to be ignorant of what they are, but we want to be not be ignorant of what they're for. Uh, And they are for the building up of the body. Um, And so when Paul here talks really throughout 1 Corinthians 12 all the way through chapter 14 as he stays on this subject, um, throughout the passage, Uh, Similarly, as in the passage in Romans, uh, he is talking about building the body into a healthy, functioning body. And part of the way that the Holy Spirit does that is by giving gifts that help to build it up. Um, Not every use of the gifts might necessarily build up the church if they're misused. And so it's important to make sure that we understand how they're to be used so that they might do their job and build up the body. It's also important to recognize that the Holy Spirit, as Paul says, gives these gifts as he wills. Uh, Again, as we spoke about the personality and deity of the Holy Spirit, um, Paul here refers to the Holy Spirit as God, talking about it's the same God who is ultimately distributing these things in the context of speaking about them being gifts given by the Holy Spirit, distributing as he wills. He decides who should have what gifts, um, maybe even arguably for what period of time. It may very well be that uh, certain gifts are valuable for certain kinds of ministry at certain times. Um, Chuck Smith, uh, uh, if, if you're familiar with Calvary Chapel, the church we're part of, Chuck Smith years ago used to talk about this passage. And, um, and uh, when someone would say, what's the best gift? Well, you know, he would sort of liken that to the idea of, well, it depends on what job you're doing. You know, if I go out to the tool shed because I'm working on something, you know, a saw might be the right tool or a hammer might be the right tool. So what's the best gift? Well, the Holy Spirit knows what the best gift is for the right person at the right time. And so uh, we'll talk about some of these things as we go through the various gifts of the Holy Spirit. But it's important that we understand them and recognize that they are for the building up. And so we shouldn't be um, ignorant about this. And Paul also later would say that we also also should not be immature or children in regard to these things, in regard to their use. Uh, In other words, the gifts um, um, can be abused, but they ought not be abused. We ought not see them so much as ways to dazzle and impress as much as they are tools with which to build. And so um, with that in mind, uh, we'll go ahead and, 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 and begin to make our way through the gifts as we go through this, again, sort of series within a series. We've been talking about the Holy Spirit. Now we're going to focus on the gifts of the Holy Spirit for a little bit. Um, it's also probably not a bad uh, idea to, to, to mention why I was including 1 Corinthians 13 uh, in, the, uh, in the context of Paul's writings from 12 to 14 on the subject of the Holy Spirit. If you're familiar with 1 Corinthians 13, then you're probably think, thinking to yourself, well, that's the love chapter. That's that kind of, Paul sort of departs for a minute and talks about love and all this kind of a thing. And then he comes back to the, to the gifts. Well, there's really not a break in the action when Paul's talking about these things. But in fact, the fact that Paul brings the idea of love and, and really spends time unpacking what love really is and what it isn't, um, uh, right in the midst of a discussion on the gifts, I think is extremely well-placed. Of course, as the Holy Spirit inspired it, right? But it makes perfect sense that you would interject love in the middle of the use of the gifts because if we, in fact, practice the gifts in genuine love, other-centered, service kinds of love, then we're probably not going to abuse it. And that was a problem within the church in Corinth. And love needed to be at the heart of their use of the gifts and of their practicing of these gifts. Uh, Interestingly, Paul in Romans 12, right after he lists a number of gifts, he doesn't go into a big definitive list or anything in Romans 12, but he does add some additional uh, uh, content to the subject. Uh, But he also, interestingly, as he finishes talking or listing those gifts in that passage, the very next thing he does, ending in verse 8 and now moving into verse 9 of chapter 12, he talks about love. 
and all this. And so he connects this idea. He seems to always be connecting the idea of the gifts with their proper use in love. And so, um, so it's important that we understand these things as well. Love is, of course, the supreme thing, uh, and it ultimately should invade, infect, pervade all, all of our activities in regard to our service to the Lord and to his people and even to the world outside. Um, let me switch gears for just a moment here. Um, there are, um, I, I'd like you to turn to Ephesians chapter four for a minute. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> we may talk about this again, but I, I, I just want to kind of put this out there uh, as, um, uh, as kind of a, just a, a bit of foundational um, information on the topic here. Um, in Ephesians chapter four, Paul uh, speaks of another kind of gift. In this case, uh, he refers to these gifts as being given by Jesus. And so I'm gonna go ahead and read um, uh, in Ephesians 4, 11 through uh, 16. Paul has been talking here about <clears throat> the unity of the body and one faith and one baptism. And when Jesus ascended, <clears throat> having ultimately finished the work of the cross and now ascending into heaven, he gave gifts to men. And uh, Paul quotes the Old Testament in this as well. But then he begins to talk about some of these gifts that Jesus gives to the body. And in verse 11, he says this. He says, he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the shepherds, or the pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body and of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by waves, uh, by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way un, uh, into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with uh, which it is equipped, uh, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now here, Paul again speaks of the idea of gifts, fundamentally different kinds of gifts, but he again equates it with love and building up the body and maturity and all this kind of a thing. There's a consistent theme about what God gives the church and the responsibility they have to use these things that are given to them, to her, and ultimately to build, uh, build itself up in love. Now, what about these gifts? These are actually uh, sometimes pointed to as the fivefold ministry, as it's referred to, um, although it's arguable whether there's four or five gifts here. But, um, but these gifts are somewhat different than the gifts that Paul lists again in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 and in Romans chapter 12 as well. These gifts in particular, apostles and prophets, uh, evangelists, pastors and teachers, the idea of pastor and teacher uh, seems to indicate one particular role of pastor teacher. Um, but that either way, uh, as we look at this list, um, these gifts given by Jesus, interestingly, not really referred to as gifts of the Holy Spirit as much as they are gifts given by Jesus, are also different in regard to what they are. These are more roles than giftings, like we saw in the list we read in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, and that we would read about in Romans 12. These gifts seem to be more roles or offices than the giftings of the Holy Spirit, like tongues, prophecy, and so on. Uh, and so I just want to take a minute to draw a distinction here. Uh, and and this, this is another controversial thing. Um, because there are those that claim to be apostles modern day or prophets modern day. Uh, certainly we have people with a gift of evangelism. Certainly we have evangelists. We have pastors and teachers. I uh, hope so, otherwise I'm out of a job. But we, we have these roles. But what about things like apostles and prophets? You know, are there still apostles and prophets today? So I want to take a minute to talk about this uh, kind of at the outset, because when we talk about things like uh, prophecy and such. It's important that we understand what was meant by Paul for that time and what was meant now. Now, again, I know that already sounds kind of controversial, but hear me out on this. When it comes to the idea of apostles, there were 12. Actually, you could argue there were 13 or were there maybe 14 ultimately by the time we get to uh, the end of the, the, the New Testament era. When I say 12, we talk about the original 12 that Jesus chose, 
However, Judas uh, betrayed the Lord, hanged himself, and then was replaced by another, uh, ultimately uh, Matthias, as we see in the book of Acts. However, we also see Paul, uh, an apostle born out of uh, due time, chosen specifically by the Lord to be an apostle. But that's a kind of a different discussion, but I just mentioned that the apostles there were those who were chosen by the Lord, uh, or his own apostles, as it was with Matthias and that. But when we talk about the apostles, we're talking about those that form the foundation of the church. Matter of fact, even as Paul himself says here, uh, uh, the foundation built upon prophets and apostles um, uh, and that kind of, or we, we see in the, in the scriptures the idea of, of the church being built upon a foundation of prophets and apostles, as Paul would write elsewhere. That foundation has been laid. And when we talk about apostles and prophets in that sense, we're talking about roles and offices that do not exist today. Uh, there are not apostles today like there were among those there in the New Testament. People like Paul or like, you know, Matthew or John or James or Andrew or Peter and so on, uh, Nathaniel. We, you know, when we talk about these guys, these are the apostles whose names are written on the 12 foundations uh, in the New Jerusalem and that. We, when we see these things, we recognize that is a specific office that was established in the first century to lay the foundations for the church. And the prophets that are spoken of in that same sense are those that gave us, for example, the word of God, or maybe those even in the first century who spoke prophetic words uh, specifically under the guidance of the Holy Spirit that ultimately became inscripturated. Uh, in other words, Luke was not an apostle, but he was inspired of the Holy Spirit. And you could say that in the sense that he gave us God's literal words, uh, we could we could put that under the, 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 the heading of prophecy. When we talk about John writing the book of Revelation, he's speaking of future events from his time. He's talking obviously about things that are happening in his time, but he's talking about future events as well. That is prophecy that has been inscripturated. Are there prophets today? Are there prophets that spoke that did not actually have their prophecies in scripture? Sure, Philip's daughters, for example, they were prophetesses, but we don't know what they prophesied about. Um, we have Agabus, who, uh, who spoke a word of prophecy about Paul. Um, he didn't give us like new truth per se, in the sense that like, you know, uh, like a book of the Bible, but we do see him prophesying within scripture about Paul and the, the events that would happen with him. Does God speak today? Well, we'll talk more about that when we get to uh, the subject of prophecy and that as a spiritual gift, I would suggest in some sense, yes, but not in the sense that we are getting new scripture today. And it's important to make that distinction. The canon of scripture is closed. <clears throat> there is no new revelation that is on par with the word of God. And we need to be careful when we, when we say something like, thus saith the Lord. Now when I say we, I don't say that unless I'm gonna quote scripture. Um, and I don't typically say that anyway, I just read the scripture. But if someone says, thus saith the Lord, and claims to be speaking on behalf of God, that's a very, very, very um, dangerous thing to say, because if you just spout something off that's not really from God, you have essentially misled somebody, and you've led them to believe that you are speaking on behalf of God when you're not. So prophecy is an interesting thing. Paul dealt with the gift of prophecy in the first century, and so there's reason to think that the gift would still exist today. However, uh, in the same way that um, that many of those in, in the church of Corinth, or even again Philip's daughters, spoke a word of prophecy, doesn't mean that that prophecy is necessarily on par with the word of God. It might have been something very specific uh, about a future event that was coming, but it's not something that we would look at and say this is inspired scripture. The only things we consider to be inspired on the level of scripture is scripture. So um, that being said, we'll talk more about that when we get to the gift of prophecy, but I wanted to speak to that for a moment. Um, there are roles of evangelists and pastor teachers that continue on today. However, the apostles were a specific group in the first century. <clears throat> uh, there are those today that call themselves apostles, and in the sense that an apostle is one sent on a mission, in the most general sense of the term, you could probably apply that. But, um, but if we're claiming apostolic authority the same way the apostles had it, like for example, there's a movement today called the New Apostolic Reformation, uh, NAR. And so this is a group that claims to sort of have a restoration 
of that apostolic authority that was given to the apostles in the first century and has now been restored in our day. That is not true, that is false, and that is absolutely something that you should completely not buy into. Um, when people speak scripture, they can speak on the authority of what God has said. If they teach the word and divide it correctly and all, you can speak with the authority of God's word behind you. You can share these things and stand on that. However, to claim a certain level of authority that is somehow beyond what the average Christian has, because now you somehow have the apostolic authority like Peter did or like John did or something, that's completely misguided and you need to be very careful about that kind of a thing. Uh, I know that that's a very uh, popular thing. I know that that kind of thing draws a lot of people because we want to hear God speaking today like he did to them. You know something, God is speaking today like he did to them. As a matter of fact, you can read what they said and you can hear what God is still saying to us today through it. And so go to the word, not these ideas that are being propagated. Um, and then uh, that, that kind of leads me to, um, to one last thing I want to talk about today. And that is the idea uh, of the gifts being today at all. Are they for today? Um, it's another kind of controversial subject, actually. Um, it ought not be because, um, you know, the scriptures speak very clearly about these things. And um, the debate on the subject of whether the gifts of the Holy Spirit are for today or not really centers around the idea that they, uh, for those that believe they, they aren't for today, the idea is that the gifts died off in the first century with the apostles and the, and the closing of the canon, the final revelation of God uh, through the apostle John. And therefore, after that time, there was no longer a need for the gifts because we now had the completed scripture um, and that kind of a thing. Uh, I, I disagree with that. I'm not in that camp. Um, uh, generally, when we talk about the gifts, we, we sometimes fall into two camps, polar opposites. One is uh, what is the cessationist view, which is the idea that the gifts ceased in the first century. Uh, and then there is um, sort of this other end of the spectrum where the gifts are wildly abused and, and people are, um, you know, um, like you maybe you saw years ago, I think it was at Rodney Howard Brown and Kenneth Copeland having a conversation in tongues kind of thing. Just goofy kinds of malpractices and I'm not even I'm not even sure that was actually any kind of a, a gift of tongues. But um, but wild abuses or it's done. There are no more gifts for today. Or at least not the, the, the more charismatic gifts like tongues and prophecy and healings and things like that. Um, I, I would I would consider myself what is called a continuationist, somebody that um, is is uh, holds the view that because Scripture never explicitly says that the gifts were going to end uh, within uh, and their use within the body of Christ, that they do continue on today. However, I strongly stand opposed to the abuses that are often practiced on some of the televangelist channels and all those kinds of things. Um, I, I I think the minute that God actually performs a healing through somebody. Uh, someone lays hands on somebody and prays and they're healed. Okay, what do you say to that? When God gives a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge, which we'll talk about next time as we start our look at the gifts themselves, um, when God does give a word of knowledge that somebody, you know, um, you know, realizes, wow, that was absolutely for me. Uh, or somebody speaks in a tongue and someone else is there, you know, in a language they didn't you know, have prior knowledge of, and we'll, again, we'll talk about these things, and then somebody's there to interpret it. And we can verify that that's an interpretation. We see a valid expression of the gifts. Well, obviously when that happens, we're, we're no longer able to say that the gifts have ceased. Uh, we may not see them as much on display as we did right away in the first century when the church was first born, um, but to say that they've ceased is an entirely different thing. And so I don't agree with that. Um, but I, I, I don't think that means that I have to buy into the craziness that goes on on the other end of the spectrum. I think like all things, even as Paul says, uh, all things decently and in order. If we understand the gifts being used in their proper context for their proper use uh, with, with love at the heart of it and genuine reliance and openness on the Holy Spirit, who we ought not be afraid of, by the way. The Holy Spirit, as we said earlier, is not the sort of the, uh, the loose canon of the Trinity or something like this. Now, the Holy Spirit is like Christ with the same ultimate intention and goal in mind uh, and, and ultimately his desire is to bring us closer to Jesus. And so when he gives gifts, it's ultimately to build up the church so that we might uh, find ourselves drawn closer to him. So with that being said, 
um, we're going to go ahead and, uh, and, and end there for today. But we'll begin to look at the gifts more specifically next time as we begin to go through the lists that Paul gives and describe what these gifts are and try to describe like what a, a proper use is, uh, describe what some of the misuses are, because we don't want to be afraid of this kind of a thing. Um, uh, we, instead, we want to understand it and embrace uh, what these gifts are, because it may very well be that God has a gift among these for you to practice that would build up and edify the church. Now, by the way, I guess I'll close on this thought, um, just by way of transparency and full disclosure. Uh, I, one of the gifts, uh, that probably the single most um, central gift that tends to be focused on is the gift of tongues because it's supernatural, it's exciting, all this kind of a thing. Um, I just wanna share with you, I don't speak in tongues which A, I don't believe every Christian necessarily does speak in tongues. I don't hold that view, nor do I think scripture teaches that. Um, but just so you know, I don't speak in tongues. I'm not saying there's something wrong with speaking in tongues, but I don't. And I say that because what I'm, the point I'm making is, is that I'm not taking the side of trying to perpetuate the idea that the gifts are for today because I have something to defend. Hey, I speak in tongues, and so therefore I need to really back this whole thing up. No, I don't speak in tongues. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I don't, for the best of my knowledge, I've never prophesied, you know, that kind of a thing. So it's, it's um, you know, it's not like I have some supernatural gifts that I've got a thing to defend. I just simply believe that the scriptures teach on this and, uh, and we want to share on them with knowledge and understanding and not close the door to these things if in fact God has not closed the door to them, but instead to understand them and practice them again, as we said earlier, as Paul describes uh, at the end of chapter 14, that they would be practiced decently and in order so that proper edification might take place. So with that said, we're gonna go ahead and dive into a study on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and we'll begin to look at those specifically as we go through those lists next time. So let me pray us out, and uh, I'd encourage you to go ahead and read 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. Uh, I'd encourage you to read Romans 12, and uh, one through, uh, well, just read Romans 12. One through eight is, where he talks more about the list, but but nine on again talks about love and the idea of building the body up together. These are important ideas overall to understand together and not not see them as separate things. So Father, we thank you for uh, the topic we're about to enter into. We thank you for the Holy Spirit and the fact that He desires to build up the body so that we might bring glory to Jesus. Now we just pray that as we talk about these things, controversial as they might be, that we would gain understanding. That as Paul said, we wouldn't be ignorant and we wouldn't be immature about it, but rather we would approach these things with a desire to know and even embrace and uh, as we understand and, and even pray that you might uh, let us know what gift you might have for us, that we might build the body up by the use of it. And so we thank you and we praise you for the fact that the foundation has been laid, but the growth of the church continues. And we just pray that uh, as we study these things, that we would see the place of the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the building up of the body and love under the full measure of Christ. And so we thank you for this, Father. We pray that you guide our times together. Help us to always turn to the word as the final word on these things and on everything that we study in regard to our faith and how we live it out. So Father, we praise you and thank you for this. We love you and bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have comments or thoughts, uh, I, have a, I have a feeling this topic is going to stir up some comments. And so by all means, feel free to reach out you can do this on our YouTube channel. You can do this on our church website. You can email me through there at calvarychapelfranklin.com uh, or you can email me at pastorbrian at calvarychapelfranklin.com. Uh, you can also go to my personal website at pa uh, parsonspad.com where these videos are also posted and you can comment there. You can also email me there uh, through that website as well. But um, most of all, I just encourage you to go to the scripture, study it, understand it, love it, spend your time in it, uh, and let's continue to go through it together. So God bless you and we'll see you next time.